So again, we are on the API designs and API styles um, stage. Our next speaker is Everett Pott from Bad Gateway Incorporated. Everett is the CTO there. And so we will turn to Everett. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Everett, and I'm going to be talking today about um, a library called Ketting. Um, originally, I think on the agenda, the, uh, the talk was, um, so this is an introduction to hypermedia with Ketting, and originally on the agenda, I think it's called this, but then as I was preparing the slides and doing rehearsal, I realized I wasn't entirely sure how to pronounce this, so I ended up changing it last minute. Um, so quick history for uh, Ketting. Um, I, uh, in around 2016, I uh, joined a new uh, startup in Toronto, and um, I was hired to uh, lead the design, uh, sorry, lead a team and design the uh, API for a new product we were working on. Um, and I think at the time we knew we wanted to do uh, REST and we knew, uh, wanted to do JSON, uh, but one of the earliest design decisions we had to make was uh, what format do we use for the API? Um, and I think, you know, we could have used uh, just plain JSON over HTTP. Uh, but one worry uh, I think I had and others were uh, that we would have to invent a lot of uh, ideas from scratch. So uh, we thought that, you know, if we use an existing format, then some questions that we might have might be answered either by tooling or uh, just by knowledge from a community. Um, so some of those examples are, you know, how does a relationship look like? Um, so in the example here, uh, you know, we have two relationships, an actor ID or actors and directors. and we just specify them as ID and we're kind of assuming that the client is able to take those IDs and then figure out how to get more information for them. Um, other examples are how do we change these relationships? How do filters work? Um, how do pa how does paging work? Uh, and what does a collection of things look like? So, um, so we looked at a few different formats and eventually landed on something called HAL. Um, and I think um, you know, one of the reasons was that HAL was a pretty lightweight addition to kind of the things that we already kind of liked, which was, you know, simple JSON and uh, simple kind of CRUD style REST. Um, so another contender was JSON API, but it felt a little bit too far for, uh, I think, what we were used to and comfortable with. Um, so we, um, so um, yeah, as you can see, this is kind of the same um, document again. And instead of having a bunch of IDs in a response, we now uh, use links in a response. Um, so one, one of the advantages here is that you don't just see kind of what a relationship is, but also you immediately get information on how to access more information uh, about this. So we, you know, Nicholas Cage is an actor in this, uh, this movie. And um, so we also immediately have instructions on how to get more information about Nicholas Cage. Um, so that that idea was pretty appealing to me, and I think even at the time, like I, knew, I was aware of like hypermedia and that kind of stuff. I don't think I was like 100% sold on the concept uh, as a whole because there's a lot, a lot more to it. But just kind of uh, being able to just express the relationship as links like seemed kind of neat. So uh, that's kind of where we went with. And uh, so here's some more examples of things that uh, you would express with how. Um, like everything really centers around link. That's the most important aspect. And um, so the first, the topmost link is an author link. So you might, you know, say the, the author of this document, uh, you can find it over here. Uh, what's interesting here is that you can, you know, links don't just have to be uh, relative URLs or point to the same API. They can point to entirely different APIs. Uh, one example where we found this to be useful in the past is we need to actually point um, from our API to some GitHub resources for um, a system we were working on. And we realized that the GitHub API actually also, also uses some hypermedia elements. And uh, so instead of you know, creating some system that would reinterpret GitHub or create multiple clients for different uh, systems, we were actually just able to just point to GitHub and our client would be able to follow those, those links to the external API. Um, the next next one, the, the next link um, is, uh, this is kind of the main system that we use for paging. Um, so if there's like a large collection of things, then using a next link, you can indicate to a client there's more to be found here. And the last last one to describe by it is an example of more metadata. Uh, we use JSON schema a lot for um, to um, describe our API. 
So uh, if we have a describe by link, then a client might be able to figure out how to validate information from the API or information that needs to send to the API, or for example, um, create TypeScript types automatically. So um, the first consumer of our API was going to be our sort of SBA JavaScript client. And um, I was at this point a couple of weeks into the new job. And, and I think our expectation was that since we used, you know, somewhat popular format, that we were, uh, this, this would be big enough that we were gonna be able to find some good clients for JavaScript. So we didn't have to write the code. So it started kind of dawning on me that maybe that was, that's not the case. And um, so, you know, I was getting a little nervous because like we kind of like, I was an advocate for this idea and then uh, realized that the front end team kind of had to build some of these things from scratch. So, uh, and because I was fairly new and I had this kind of like new job anxiety, I ended up just spending evenings on building the clients, the open source client that we would eventually start using in this company. Um, I didn't know it, this at the time, but you know, we're five, six years later and I'm still working on it. And actually now uh, I uh, own a small consultancy business where we use this tool and build a lot of hypermedia services for our customers. So what is Ketting? Um, it's a couple of things. So it's a, as you can imagine, it's a REST client and REST kind of in a more academic sense and not just, you know, CRUD. Um, it's a system for synchronizing resource state between, between server and client. And you know, it has like systems that lets you, you know, expire stuff on the client and, you know, just make sure that you always have a consistent state. Um, it's a system that handles the uh, cache and invalidation, which is, you know, a tricky subject. Um, the, despite running in a browser, we did have to kind of come up with our own cache because uh, the browser cache doesn't really give you good programmatic access and um, doesn't let us easily expire stuff from JavaScript. Um, so over time, the, the cache system involved quite a bit. Um, there's a middleware system um, similar to what you might see on server-side frameworks. We have one on the client side letting you rewrite requests and responses, and that's the main um, hook that lets you uh, implement stuff like authentication, like OAuth 2. Um, it also does something called transcluding. Um, this uh, transcluding allows us basically to reduce the chattiness of hypermedia and REST by combining multiple requests and responses. So it has a system for uh, teasing those uh, responses apart and also signaling to the server that it might be interested in multiple responses in the future. So the server can optimize for that. And lastly, it does stuff around actions and forms, which is also a key thing in hypermedia. Um, so I'm not gonna be talking about any of those things today because um, we only have about 20 minutes. So uh, the next uh, yeah, next 15 minutes or so, just mostly be focusing on just kind of the basics. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully one day I can do like a two hour version of this because I can go on about this forever. So this uh, is kind of the most fundamental way you would probably start working with an uh, API. Um, and uh, so in the first line, you we instantiating a client, we're giving it something called, often called a bookmark URL. And that's this is also what it would be uh, called in the original de REST dissertation. And it's kind of like the starting point. We use this to expand all relative URLs. And the second line, we're getting access to a movie resource. Um, Right now, we're hard coding this year, this uh, relative URL here, but ideally, you want to discover as much as possible. Um, and from uh, the movie resource, we are following a list of actor links. And then for each actor link, we're uh, just console logging it. So um, yeah, so these are kind of these are kind of the main fundamentals. Is like a resource uh, express like is manages a single endpoint on one of your APIs. And uh, from the resource, you get functions like follow and follow all, and also functions representing the HTTP methods like get, post, put, and so on. So the um, really like a, when you think of a REST API that uses hypermedia, we you can think of it as a graph. And sometimes you need to kind of traverse the graph to get exactly what you want. So you can also chain um, hopping from link to link so using the follow method. It uses promises all under the hood. And as soon as you kind of get to your final destination, you can wait for the promise to be resolved. Uh, so here we might start from a collection of to-dos and then grab the first item in a to-do. Uh, of the first item, we want, want to know the author. And from the author, we want to know what their website is. 
So it's um, it also occurred to me that like the, the kind of these link fundamentals, like they're not they don't come from hell. They come you know from very early versions of HTML. And so there's other formats out there that uh, also have you know a means to express these kind of URLs. So uh, the first the first one you probably seen if you ever written HTML, I'm sure you have. Um, like HTML documents can have links, and the most common one is style sheet, but they can be really be anything. Uh, HTTP headers also have links, which is useful because um, you uh, maybe part of your API you serve images, and images by themselves can't easily embed a link. Uh, however, you can use the HTTP headers to uh, add links to images. And the third one is a, a small piece of a JSON API uh, response, and JSON API itself also has um, kind of hypermedia controls and support for that. So. What we've done with Ketting is that, say, hypothetically, if your API uses a mixture of all these, then Ketting doesn't really care. Um, if we go back to the previous slide, um, all these kind of hops uh, from you know list of to-dos to an author to a website, if one of those were HTML or JSON API or how, it will just transparently consume those. And um, which, uh, as a result, we I, we ended up building for for some of our internal APIs. We our some of our endpoints just return HTML because it made more sense. Like a lot of APIs might have a home document, which is kind of the starting point where other APIs may be discovered from. And uh, so we started using HTML for some of these because if it's HTML, then a developer might be just able to just open up in their browser and we might be able to add a lot more flavor and documentation links to API responses. So as long as it just has a main concept of link, we can support it. And I think getting supports about six or seven different formats. Um, so a few more small examples. So if we wanted to do grab a to-do from an API, um, we use .get on line two. And uh, if we want to then make a change to this to-do, we can set it to complete it, and then we can just send it right back. Um, so this will just use an HTTP put request under the hood. Um, an operation like this will also automatically update the cache. Um, so um, the internal cache, uh, Ketting knows that when you do put a request, you replace an, a resource. So the internal cache for Ketting will then be your new state. And if there's other subscribers to this cache, because there is also an underlying event system, all, all of these will get a notification for this. Um, one more example is if we um, if we want to create a new resource, a very common pattern is to do a post request on a collection or something. So we have a post follow function. There's also a post function, but there's some nuance on what the difference is. But this one is specifically, uh, the post follow function is specifically for using a post request to add a resource. Um, so if we use post follow, we can we create a new resource. And as long as the server returns something like uh, 201 created and a new URL, then um, the post follow function will also return the new resources again to do new operations on. Um, so in 2019, we started a new project and um, and this, is, this new project was going to use React. And I was fairly new to React at the time, so we tried to make our best, um, do our best to make getting work in this new world. And um, and also, I think in the meantime, the, the library got a bunch of traction and um, and people ran into issues and had questions on how to do this. And I think you know, what we've kind of found adopting this is that you know a lot of our components were just massive and um, quite hard to maintain, even for kind of simple tasks. And and I think you know it took me a while to kind of figure this out, but I think um, it all kind of came down to that React doesn't really like you to use promises and uh, really wants you to kind of wrap some async await and promises into different concepts. So, um, you know, I spent a lot of time kind of researching how do other people do this, and I got a lot of inspiration from the GraphQL Apollo library um, and um, and kind of figuring out, okay, this is what we want the API to be. Uh, ended up basically rewriting most of Ketting to support kind of a new paradigm. Um, all the previous examples are still, you know, valid, um, but yeah, we had to kind of rework internals to, you know, allow React clients to get access to more like deeper stuff. So the next couple of slides are some examples for how you might use this with React. Um, so Ketting itself is not React dependent or anything. We now have a, a React Ketting package that basically does the binding between the two. Um, so here's an example of how you might set up Ketting for React. Um, we um, This is on the top level of your application. Uh, you will need to set up something called a provider. 
um, the provider, you give it a client, and the client is kind of the core component from Ketting we saw earlier. Uh, this is where you would, you would do your global configuration like authentication and creating this kind of top level uh, provider lets um, gives any other component of your application access to the client and the full cache and state and context and events and all that. Um, so this is the basic setup. Um, then to um, this is an example of how uh, you might render something from a server. So if you're uh, your, if your API has an endpoint that's a to-do, then you can use our uh, use resource hook to uh, get information from, from that to-do. Uh, so you get two things back, uh, data and loading. You actually get like six more things back, but we're not going to get too deep into this now. And um, loading will be, uh, as long as we don't have a, a resource, or sorry, the response yet, loading will be true. And then as soon as we do have the data for this, then um, yeah, the, the bottom part of this component will be rendered. Uh, what's also interesting is that the uh, hypothetically, if you use a resource on in a component and use the same resource in another mounted component somewhere else on your page, uh, if one of those resources gets state updates, so does the other one. Everything works from a shared cache and um, and any kind of things that also this cache such, cache, such as a put request, uh, will have effects on everything. Um, and automatically you will get stuff like read renders. So this is how you might do a read only to do. Um, here's an example of, um, this is a, a little bit more intense, so I hope it still like makes sense for people. Um, this is how you might do a read write version of this. Um, so I think uh, if you're used to um, like GraphQL and stuff, you might do might have separate mutations from your um, read model. And, but uh, with a lot of kind of simple CRUD style REST APIs, like so many people do, uh, the model for what you would get from a server and what you would send to a server would be the same. So because of this, uh, it allows us to create some pretty easy to use um, APIs to quickly allow people to modify uh, state from a server. Um, so we're on the kind of at the top, I don't know if you can see my mouse, hopefully. Uh, you can see uh, we use re use resource again, and we're getting our data and loading properties. Uh, but this time we're getting two more, which is set data and submit. So set data lets us update the local state of this resource, and it doesn't immediately send it to the server yet. So if you use set data, then other uh, components subscribed to this state will also get those updates. And if you use the submit function, then uh, we take whatever we have in the current cache and send it to the server through a put request. Um, so um, if we go below, we see uh, instead of just emitting the, the to-do again, we're now rendering a form. And uh, we have two events set up on change. So every time somebody changes the description of the to-do in a text area, we here, we, uh, yeah, we set the local cache or we update the local cache. And then when somebody hits the submit button, we send it to a server. Um, yeah, so this is uh, yeah, so this has been pretty useful. These kind of uh, components, and it solves kind of a lot of common issue or common tasks that people might have with this. Another version of this is that you can also create new resources using this. Uh, again, with a similar paradigm that we're assuming that we're, you're going to send a post request somewhere, and that post request will result in. Um, a location header and two one created. And if you get all that, then the first request will be uh, a post request and subsequent requests will be put requests to, so you can keep updating the state of this new resource that you've, uh, that you've created. So um, yeah, just uh, as a summary of the kind of hooks that uh, we have, um, we, um, yeah, so the first one we haven't seen yet is use client. It gives you access to the full Ketting object and all the fun stuff you can do with that. Uh, use resource, you've seen a little bit, allows you to get information from uh, a server and also um, make changes to the resource. Uh, we also have a use collection um, hook, which is, um, yeah, if you um, work with a collection of things, a long list of things, uh, this gives you the full list of items and easily lets you loop through it. Um, and lastly, we have a use space collection hook now, uh, which lets you create infinite scroll type interfaces uh, using next links. Um, so I think that's all I got for today. Um, yeah, I'd love to, again, love to talk more about it. So if you have questions, feel free to contact me um, because yeah, I can talk about this forever. <laughs> 
Thanks so much, Aver. That was great. Um, thank you for the innovation and in the, in the work that you're doing and all of the wonderful insight that you've shared today. So a couple of questions for you. The first one is, you know, what hasn't worked well about Swagger for you? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think um, also, also there's an assumption that it didn't work that well for us, which is actually true. Um, I think we, uh, um, if if you use a straight up Swagger, I think it just doesn't work really well with hypermedia because um, Swagger kind of assumes um, that everything is based on the fixed fix URL pass. So if we ever want to kind of to make these kind of changes to URLs, then suddenly Swagger doesn't work anymore. And um, with hypermedia, we're no we're no longer assuming that the path in an API is part of the contract. Um, it's not so. The only thing that's part of the contract is what which links appear. So I think there's been some work done to create either like an extension of Open API or a version of Open API, uh, which is a new name for Swagger um, um, that. Uh, actually is based on relationships as opposed to uh, hard paths. And I think ha if that exists, then we would probably start using uh, start using this. We do use JSON schema for a lot of stuff, because, and which is a key component of open API, but we use it to describe uh, our media types and not, um, um, yeah, the, the URL part of this. Great. Thank you so much. Our next question is, you know, implementing Hadios is never easy. So what was the driver for going down this path in the first place? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I think um, when we started with this, we weren't necessarily bought into all of this, all of these ideas. And um, because I was kind of, I had a similar opinion that, um, you know, it's a lot to ask, I think, from clients to kind of follow this all strictly. And also, I think at the time, a, a common complaint was there's no good clients for this. Um, so what all we wanted at the time was to just do a JSON API, um, but then have some way to express relationships and have these other features without necessarily buying into the, this whole world. And um, and I think um, as we did that, we found that there are actually a ton of advantages to this and that make it so much easier um, to build things. So I, I went from this is a pretty specialized technique that not everyone should use to, uh, you know, I think this is a great default uh, for people and more people should should talk about this. Wonderful. So our next question says, you know, I haven't seen too many clients excited about this. And so do users actually want to use Hadios? Um, so uh, I would say from my, uh, from my point of view, yes. And I, it's kind of a tangent, um, but I think a key thing that made a lot of people want to use our APIs and are excited to kind of reuse it after they've used it once is that we make a habit out of all of our APIs emit JSON, but they also emit HTML. So we have like middlewares that will take the existing JSON and grab the links and basically render a developer interface for this. And now, um, and I think, you know, this gives a similar uh, advantage that a lot of people like with GraphQL, if I say that correctly, is it gives you a way to inspect uh, not just what APIs are available, like open API might give you, but also what data is associated to this. So the uh, our auto gen they're basically auto generated developer interfaces that aren't just like endpoint focused, they are data and graph focused. And I think um, anyone interested in this, I would extremely strongly suggest to also uh, have all your APIs emit HTML um, and let people access your APIs with browsers. So I don't want to see just an 401 error and I need an OAuth token when I hit your API. I want to, you know, I want to be able to open it in your browser. And once you have that in place, I think it kind of starts speaking for itself in a lot of ways. Great. And then the final question for you is, you know, you spoke a little bit about caching. And so, you know, would you say that caching simplifies caching? Um, and if so, why, why is that? Um, I so um, I, I don't know if I have time to go too deep into this, but um, the um, one of the issues with uh, or one of the advantages people will say that REST has over GraphQL, and I've, I'm making this comparison a lot, is that you can kind of take advantage of existing infrastructure like caching. And what I found practically, this is not really true because I think what people need from API clients and in terms of caching, a browser doesn't like nearly do enough and the HTTP standard alone also doesn't do enough. So so I would say yes, like uh, it makes this a lot easier. And I think we very much like build getting with actual real world use cases in mind. So uh, yeah, I hope if you use this, this will indeed be a lot easier for you. 
Thank you. Thank you for all those wonderful questions and for your responses, Avert. Um, will you please tell us how, you know, other how folks can access you during this conference and after? Uh, yeah, sure. I think if you Google my name, I'm pretty sure that I'm the only person in the world with this name. So <laughs> there should be some ways to find me. Uh, but also I will uh, join hop in uh, immediately after this to see if there's anyone else who wants to chat. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for having me. Thanks.